Good morning. I want to thank you for being here to worship with us. I want to welcome the people online joining us there. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we're continuing on in our Christmas series. Like I said, I, most, on this side of Christmas, most of you are probably taking down the decorations and you're not celebrating it anymore, but here the decorations are staying for just a bit longer. Uh, part of that is because we're tired and we don't want to take them. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> it's beautiful. It's a beautiful setting to continue talking about the Christmas story. And for these next few weeks, we're going to look at some, some different aspects of the story that we don't normally focus in on, uh, just to, to see what we learn uh, going past his birth and into uh, the, 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 this visit from the Magi. Um, I think most of us probably have this, this perfect picture of Christmas in Bethlehem. Uh, you know, we, we read the little children's stories, and, and we see the little... Christmas pageants, and, and we look at manger scenes, and we think, oh, it was just a beautiful night. I, I guarantee you, if you've ever been involved in the birth of a child, you, you probably could think differently about it, and you probably think, here Mary was, and these strange men come in to see the baby, which you always welcome strangers into your place to see your baby. The night that they were there, I, if there were animals around, I have my doubts. It was really silent. I've, I've seen animals. I lived on a farm. Uh, they, they weren't silent all the time. It, it's just we, we, we have this ideal picture, and, and sometimes I think we, we, we need to come to see that it isn't exactly what we may have learned when we were a kid. There, there's a lot more to it. There's a lot, a lot of parts that, that we might hold to for tradition's sake that aren't really the most accurate. There's even songs we sing that, that may not paint the best picture for us. And, and while some people would go, well, what's the big deal? What does, what does it matter if we put the three kings in the, in the manger scene? Well, maybe it's, that's not a huge thing, but, but what, I, what, I, what I'm getting at is this. We should always be careful when we consider what the Bible actually says versus what popular culture has taught us. There, there's a difference there. We, we need to consider what the actual Scripture tells us happened here. At some point, we've got to come to terms that, that some of what we might have learned throughout our, our, our journey of faith, it, it might not be biblically true. And while maybe it's not a, a big ordeal when we're talking about the Magi coming or how peaceful it was the night he was born, but there are points where, where that becomes an issue. And so I would rather us... See, the, the point of... of seeing mistaken notions of Christmas. It's not to take the joy out of, of the holiday, but it's rather we need all false notions of these events and our, our watered-down versions of their significance to be demolished by the Word of God. That's what we uphold as truth. And so I, I want us to get that in our heads. Within Scripture, we, we read about the birth of Christ. There are things that we see that we need to emulate, like, like, like the, the idea that singing is a fitting reaction to the birth of Jesus. I mean, Again, go back and, 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 and walk through the story and, and the way these people received him, that was completely and totally appropriate. It was, it was, it was really a, the only reaction. <laughs> I mean, worship, praise, surrender, the, the, the sacrificial offering of our lives are the only proper responses to the coming of our Savior. That's really the only way we can celebrate him. We get a glimpse of this kind of worship-filled response when we, we, we really dig into the Magi and their story, their, their part in, in Matthew chapter 2. These verses will teach us that we, we can learn about the global purpose of God in all of history and the ultimate purpose of God in our lives. I want us to get that today. I want us to, to look at this, this part that we, we don't always focus in on. And so we're going to read Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and here's what it says. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. 
Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to the rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Again, it's a part of the Christmas story that we overlook most times, but, but did you hear what we just read? This is the part of the story that's filled with magicians and constellations and, and opposition and deception. I mean, this is like a movie of the week. Remember when they used to have those? This is, this is good stuff. Now, the magicians, they're probably not what we might think of when we hear the word, that they're wise men. The star that leads the wise men to find Jesus, that's not just any star. This is like a supernatural thing going on that God's saying, here, follow this. This opposition, this opposition is from a king who has a, a history, who has a reputation of being bad. And deception, <laughs> just tell me where he's at. I just want to worship him. Not probably true. Flat out lies. This, there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot to learn that confirms Jesus is the king he is, and the response it requires out of those who believe is something that we need to look at. We need to, to really dig into. It's something we need to study so that we can know the truth of God's word and discover what part of the story may teach us in light of the newborn king. But before we jump into that, before we get to what we can learn from them, I want to address what we know about them and what we don't know about them. If I were to ask you how many wise men were there, what would you say? Three, right? It's in every manger scene. We don't know that. They, they're the best guess is we get three because there were three gifts, right? So, so we, we assume, th- we have no idea. There could have been 10. There could have been 30 of them. I see some of you going, oh my gosh, he just destroyed Christmas. No, I didn't. I'm just telling you what's true. We, we don't know, and it's okay to not know, all right? But, but we don't know how many there were. We, we don't know a lot about them. We know they weren't kings. Uh-oh, there goes that one, right? This word magi, it translates to wise men. There, there, there is a lot of information out there that you can find, that you can search, that you can study that will tell you some things that are believed about them. There's names for them. There's countries they came from. There's a lot that they've, they've, they've pulled together, but none of it's in Scripture. And so you may choose to believe some of it, but we don't know that any of it is scripturally accurate. But what is more important about the Magi is not what we don't know, but what we do know. First, we know their setting, the East. Yeah, it's general. There, there's a lot of places and possible locations they could have come from, but Matthew tells us they're from the East. They came west in order to find Jesus. Another thing we know about them is they were men of prominence. They were high-ranking officials with power and influence. These men were well-respected with roles in both religion and politics, politicals. I feel like I've been off for three weeks, and this is the first time I've preached. It's rough. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) They were had roles in both religion and politics in their own lands. The position is is evident in the wealth that they brought with them. And the the reality is they probably didn't travel alone. I know we get that vision of them on the camels and the three of them going over the the sand, right? It was probably an entourage. You're carrying a wealth like that, you're not going to go by yourself. You're going to go protected. And again, if it's not just three of them, there's ten of them and there's enough to protect that ten, this is quite a movement, So we learn about these type of men. This is how we know about them. We learn about them in Daniel. Remember Daniel? The position he got placed in, he was over the Magi. He he worked with them. It's likely these men were influenced by Jewish teachings, and, and through their study of the stars, they were drawn by this star on a journey to worship the one born king of the Jews. 
And so, so that's what we know. That's what we don't know. There's a lot more, and I encourage you to spend some time digging into this. This is interesting. There's a lot of neat things here to, to figure out. But I want to move on to, to what we can learn from them, what the Magi teach us when they encounter the Messiah. So three thoughts this morning, and the first is this. The Magi recognize the Messiah. See, these men had studied the Hebrew Scripture. They had a knowledge of the prophecies of the coming king. These Scriptures are the ones that we would trace back to, to the time of Daniel. And the, the Magi had to study the writings of Daniel, and most likely Isaiah, because they were expecting a Jewish king to arrive at the end of the first century. He was the one. And if they're looking for him, if they're searching for him, if they're aware that he's coming, this is what they're looking to. They believed what they had studied, and they recognized this newborn as the king of the Jews, as the Messiah, before they even met him. Because of what they had learned, because of the time they'd put, they recognized him as the Messiah. They saw the truth of Scripture. They acknowledged what God had done, knowing that at this point, now they had to seek him out. And they had to do it because this is what wise men did. They, they, they honored kings. They paid their respects. They offered gifts. They truly recognized Jesus as such, or they would not have journeyed to see him. If they didn't think he was the, the king of the Jews, they wouldn't have went to him. But they did. This was a, and this wasn't like a drive to the hospital, right? This, this was a journey. Hundreds to thousands of miles, they, they speculate. that they, they traveled this. It was dangerous. I'm certain if, it, they wouldn't have done that if they didn't believe what they had read and, and studied for themselves. Along with Scripture, they'd studied also these, these signs of the stars that confirmed to them that Jesus had been born. If you go back to Numbers, Numbers 24, we see Balaam's oracle. Look at this. The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. These lines about the scepter that will arise from God's people, referring to one who rules and, and this star that will come. This, this is the prophesied king associated with the star is, is the one who, who, as the passage continues, will deliver the people of God from their enemy. Balaam's prophecy here was widely regarded as the, a messianic prophecy, a picture of the coming anointed one. So, so they watched the skies, they saw the confirmation of the new king, and they were convinced that they had to take this trip to Jerusalem to look for him. They recognized the newborn king, and now they had to go find him and honor him. What's that mean for us, though? I think here's what it means for us. Here's what we need to be asking ourselves. We've got to, we've got to figure out, do we recognize Jesus as king? We know him, probably most of us know him as savior, but do we recognize him as king? Do we accept him as king? Do, do we claim him as Lord? Because there, there's a difference there. These wise men come to him as king and we're going to find out what do they do when they see him. They bow down. They get down before him. See, sometimes I think we look at, look at our Jesus and we, we, we equate ourselves with him, right? <laughs> we're on the same level with him. We don't view him as king. As the Magi believed in what they knew, their response was to go and find him. Go and see him. We, we need to recognize him as king. What is our response to Jesus, okay? Okay. Think about that as, as we look at, after them recognizing him, their response was to come to the Messiah. They knew him. They knew who he was. They were aware of, of, of his, his, his birth, and now they had to come to him. Upon their arrival to Jerusalem, they start, they start asking around, where is this one that is born king of the Jews? Have you, have you heard about him? Where is he at? And when this happens, what, what happens? It causes panic. King Herod, King Herod gets, gets a little anxious about this because he is considered the king of the Jews. So here he is thinking, I'm good, I'm king of the Jews, and these guys come in saying, hey, we're looking for the king of the Jews. They were not looking for Herod, and this troubles Herod. 
See, he had been given control of Judea by the Romans, and he was this vicious, bloodthirsty tyrant. When, when he's notified of the arrival of the wise men and their reason for coming, the opposition to Jesus officially began. A lot of times I don't think we, we, we view the opposition to Jesus until starting when he starts his ministry and he's teaching and the Pharisees and the scribes are coming at him and trying to trip him up, right? But it began at this moment, right after his birth, already opposition. Herod's looking for him. Herod, Herod finds out what they're calling him, and he wants him dead because that's his MO. If, if, if he knows somebody's after his position, if someone's trying to become the king of the Jews over him, he's going to find him, and he's going to kill him. He was disturbed by this information. All of Jerusalem was deeply disturbed, is what, what the text tells us. Whenever he suspected this, what, what did he do? He flips out. He says, uh-uh. He was, the actual translation is he was terrified because he felt threatened by this announcement of one who would supposedly seize his reign. He wasn't the only one troubled, though. He gathers the, the religious leaders and says, hey, what, what do you guys know? He brings them in. He says, I want to know, are you aware of this? And you know what? They are. <laughs> they said, oh, yeah, he, he would have been born in Bethlehem. They knew the birthplace because they knew the prophecy. They were aware this was happening, but you know what? They didn't do anything about it. <laughs> they didn't go to Herod and say, hey, you might want to know. There's a prophecy that this guy is going to be born and it's going to be about... They hadn't told him. They hadn't done anything themselves. They wouldn't go to see the baby. They, they knew the scripture and they failed to respond. This is a cautionary tale for us. How often do we know God's word, but we don't do what it says? That's rough. But that's what they did. They, they were aware. They knew it. But they didn't do anything. And here, if these wise men had come to the Messiah, the king, it had to be true. These guys didn't just travel for fun. This was a journey to honor a king. The Magi came because of what they knew. They had recognized him. They had recognized him as the Christ. This was going to upset their world, and so the religious, the religious elite were, were getting upset too. Probably a little more so because Herod was on their case now. Yeah, it disturbed them, King Herod, the priests, the scribes, but it didn't keep the Magi from coming to the king. The Magi responded to the scripture. They had studied and fulfilled what was written in Isaiah. Look over in Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth, a thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Nations shall come to your light. These wise men come to the Messiah. It's clearly a picture of God drawing these nations to Jesus, to the light. These men represent the nations. Coming to, to the newborn king. The promised Messiah is not merely the king of the Jews, but he is the king of all people. That is amazing. That, that, that is, uh, oh, these guys journeyed from the east to the west. Like I said they estimate it to be hundreds or even thousands of miles in order to find this child, this, this king. While those who knew the prophecy... <laughs> Living right there in Jerusalem, they did nothing. They did nothing. The wise men, they knew the truth. They had to come to see this king. Ask yourself, have you come to the king? H have you come to him like you need to? Do, do you come to Jesus in all things or just when it's convenient for you? Again, <laughs> these men traveled for this. They make a trek to see the king. Sometimes we don't want to drive out to the church to worship the king, right? I mean, this is the, I know that's funny, but this, this is serious. Do we come to the king in all things? Do, do we come to him in a proper stature and attitude? Like I said, I think sometimes we just equate ourselves with Jesus and we're good, but he is the king. He is above all. We are, we are to come to him in humility, 
Maybe you, need, you, you, you know you need to come, but you're like the scribes and the, the priests, and you're like, I, I'm not going to do it. They did nothing with what they knew. See, these magi, they set the example of coming to Christ to fulfill the purpose of honoring and presenting themselves in worship. That's what we need to do. That's why we, we should come to Jesus, to worship him, to live in worship. And, and that's truly what they did. They didn't just come to the Messiah. They didn't just recognize the Messiah, but the Magi worshiped the Messiah as king. Their recognition, their journey to the Messiah resulted in the worship of this king. They told Herod, this is why we're here. We're here to worship the new king. And Herod calls him in, he he asks him, he finds out, and he goes back and he says, I want to do the same thing. Now, I'm sure he had the reputation. I'm sure they knew this was probably a lie. Herod Herod didn't worship other people. And so we, we, we know what happens. But here he is saying, I, I'm going to do it too. He just wants to find him so that he can, he can kill the baby Jesus. So we see him leave Herod, and we see the star lead them. This is that supernatural thing that, that again, you need to study a little bit, because this wasn't just any star. This wasn't a star. This star was moving. When we see a moving star, it's an airplane, right? We're all like, oh, man, wait, wait. No, nope. no, this one. This one had purpose in where it was going. It was was guiding them to find Jesus in Bethlehem. And and when they get there, when they see the child, this was the culmination of their journey. It's an encounter. Again, it probably took place long after that night Jesus was born. This did not happen on Christmas night. Okay? I'm just destroying the Christmas story for you all over. I know. I know. But I want us to know the truth of this, all right? Months later, possibly a year later, here they arrive and they see the child. Regardless of when they showed up, it tells us that they were filled with exceedingly great joy. Babies have a tendency to bring joy to most people, all right? I remember the birth of each of mine, and it was a joyous occasion each time. This past week, I got to meet my, my newest family member, Leo Martin Blankenbaker. Awesome. My cousin is his first child. It's the week after Christmas. They, they, they got home right before Christmas, so they've, they've gone the family Christmas. We go in after everything, and, he, and they're, they're like, hey, you need to go meet Leo. Jacob wants you to come over and meet Leo. That's, that's fine, but we also know what it's like to have newborns around this time of year, and it's crazy, and we know you're tired. No, he wants you to come. So we get in contact with him. You let us know when's good for you, and we'll be there, because they were out doing other things. I said, okay. So we get there, and you can just see the joy and tiredness on their faces, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, they're exhausted, but, but they're just, they're ecstatic for us to meet this new member of our family. And my kids are... are they're joyous too. They like, especially Isaac, because if there's a baby boy born in our family, it's like huge, right? We have girls to spare, but boys are a hot commodity in the, the Mendenhall, Blankenbaker, Martin houses. And so he's like, ah, oh, boy cousin. Like, I know, buddy. And to, to sit there and hold a new baby and to see the joy on the faces of the parents and to know that this is, this is, this has been big for them. It's a huge step for them. And it's just, it's awesome. And then I think back to this. <laughs> and again, this, this wasn't a newborn, but, but this is a, a, a baby, a toddler, a, a little child. And, and these, these men travel thousands of miles to see him. And, and when they encounter him, it is exceedingly great joy. That's amazing. That's awesome. I wish we got that way when we thought about our Jesus or when we came to worship our Jesus. They show up, they're overjoyed, and they respond in the only appropriate way. They bow down and worship. Get that picture in your head. I don't think the manger scenes do it justice. When you got like the 
you know, the one king stands and the one does this and the one's down on his knees. I don't think it was that. I mean, I, I envision this them prostrate just on the ground before this baby because he is the king. These, these eminent men from the east, nobles of nations, they're bowing down and worshiping a baby. You, you only bow down when you're in the presence of one that is far greater than you. They had recognized him. They came to him and they worshiped him. They then, they then offer these extravagant gifts. It was customary, particularly in ancient, the ancient east, to bring these gifts when approaching a superior. When you look in history and even in Scripture, there, there are certain ideas associated with these gifts. Have you ever wondered why it was gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Because kids have a hard time saying frankincense. You've heard it in plays. I've seen the, the, the YouTube clips of Frankenstein and all. It's great. But why? Why gold, frankincense, and myrrh? They say, they say gold more so emphasizes Jesus' royalty, Jesus as king. The frankincense relates more to Jesus' deity. And the myrrh speaks to his humanity. And, and, and research that a little bit, how that myrrh is present at his birth, but also then at his death. Study that for yourself. These gifts fit for the king that Jesus is and worship in the only way they could, bringing honor and glory Think about it. They had studied passages from Daniel, just like these verses out of Daniel chapter 7. Look at these. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That is our king. That is King Jesus. This is who they come to worship and bow down before. Jesus was this king and the wise men recognized him as such. They came to him as such and they worshiped him. It begs the question, do we do the same? Is this how we worship our king? Is this how we offer ourselves to him? They only knew the prophecies about him. We know the whole story. We've, we can read the end of the story if we want to. This part of Matthew gives us a powerful, and in many senses, a prophetic picture of joyful, reverent worship. This text, it has the potential to change everything about how you think about your life and your job and your family and really the entire world around you. These 12 verses teach us that the global purpose of God is the glad praise of Christ among the people of the world. He is the king of all people. We're part of that. We are part of that. Consider how God accomplishes this purpose in this passage. He directs nature to lead the wise men. He draws nations for his purpose. He brings them there. So I ask you, how do you worship the Messiah as king? Do you, do you bow down before him? Do you offer your life? Some of us think we have to bring something to him to offer just your life. Come as you are. We hear that. We don't believe it. But offer yourself to him. Allow your life. We, we should honestly live for this purpose. We should also die for this purpose. Give, give, give our lives, our possessions, our, our plans and our dreams for the global purpose of God, the, the glad praise of Christ among all the people of the world. We are part of that purpose. He has called us to that purpose and for that purpose. It's time for us to see that and think outside this. We need to, to, to let the nations be glad and sing for the joy of Jesus. We need to, we need to show others that. The Magi remind us, like, like the angels declaring the Christ child that night and the shepherds running to see him and going back out to tell, the Magi remind us there is need to worship the, the king and declare him to all the people of the world. I want us to see that. I want us to get that. 
I want us to begin to let others know that we recognize Jesus as King. We come to Him for salvation and we worship Him because He is worthy. It's not because we get something out of it. It's not because He gave us a way to heaven. It's because He is just worthy of worship. The story of the Magi is one that should encourage us in the way that we live. To see that it's not just about us here in in Smith Grove or us here in Greenwood, but this is a worldwide thing that he has called us to be part of. It's a beautiful part of the story. And I'm so glad that God's led us to kind of continue looking at this because we need this. As we start, I know, I know some of you made some New Year's resolutions, right? And you've already broken them, and that's okay. But I told First Service, don't make any resolutions about your relationship with God. Just make some life changes and choices to follow Him like you should. Don't, don't just get in a relationship with Him. And sometimes the best way to do that is to encounter that with other people. Join what we're doing here at Smith Grove. Read, read through Matthew with us as a church. Join, join the Behold Your God study. We're going to offer some other things in these coming months too. Find a place to plug in. Find, find a way to grow in your relationship. Here's, here's what I do know though. If you think you're going to do it alone, you're not. So sign up some people to help you this year. Ask God to give you a passion for His Word, for growth, for maturity in your life. Next week we're continuing on. And I'm going to tell you right now, next week is dark. If you know what King Herod does after this, it's a rough passage. It's probably why we don't study it and preach it. But I'm asking you to pray for me as I prepare, because when you, when you preach passages that you don't use a lot, there's a lot of study involved, a lot of time in, in figuring out what truth we need to pull out of that. So I ask you to pray for me as I prepare. I'll, I'll be praying for you, for God to prepare your hearts for what we're going to learn next week, for what He's going to teach us and show us. But as we move into a new year, what better way to start it than worshiping as the Magi? Seeing their example and saying, that is how I need to live this year. He is our King. As we get ready to close this morning, let's worship Him as our King. Let's pray. Father God, once again, I thank You for this time. I thank You for this passage. I thank You for the birth of our Savior. And Father, as we continue to celebrate it and continue to look at how this story unfolds, I pray that you would use it to open our eyes to how we need to live, how we need to follow, how we need to submit to you, to come to you humbly and to worship you as the king you are. So God, continue to grow us, continue to mature us, allow us the boldness to be those that go out and talk about your son, to tell others that he is our king that they can come to him. And Father, that all he wants is our worship. So God, help us to be obedient in whatever you lay before us. And we ask that you be honored and glorified by the offering of our song this morning in Jesus' name.